Well, good morning, everyone. It is, a, it is a blessing to be here with you, and it has been a blessing to be a part of Newberry Park for a while. Uh, Erica and I, we've gotten to participate in quite a few of the ministries here, Five Loaves, and, um, and of course, we were also part of a, of a life group here. And I tell you what, um, it has been amazing as we have gotten to share with you and grow with you. And some of you I know better than others, uh, unfortunately, because of what I do. Um, Sunday morning, I work a lot. So, uh, um, but you know, the guys and the gals down at the base, uh, you know, they need to hear about Christ uh, just like everybody else does up on, up on the grade as well, right? So this morning I was given the topic of coming clean. I don't know why Ken gave me that topic, but... <laughs> Maybe he thought, hey, Victor needs a little work in that. But that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. I think as we dive into this, as we get into this a little bit more, we're going to see the necessity of this um, and why this is such an important part of uh, our Christian growth and our Christian experience. Robert Anthony is a, is a naval historian, and he was accounting for a time whenever the Viceroy of Naples was visiting in Spain. He visited the harbor and he saw a galley ship of convicts that were used to pull the oars. I'm glad that they don't do it like that anymore. And the viceroy went aboard and he asked the men why they were there. One man said that the judge was bribed to convict him. Another said that his enemies paid people to bear false witness against him. Still another said his best friend had lied to protect himself. And finally, one man said, well, I'm here because I deserve to be. I wanted money, and I stole it. Now, with that said, the viceroy looked to the captain of the ship and said, well, here we have all of these innocent men and only one wicked man within their presence. Let's release this this wicked man so that he doesn't infect the others. And with that, (laughs) he was given a pardon. As a congregation, you have entered into this sermon series entitled Life Healing Choices. And one of the The main parts of healing is coming clean. Because here's the reality. In the introduction of the book, John Baker, he says, the truth is, life is tough. We live in an imperfect world. We've been hurt by other people. We've hurt ourselves, and we've hurt other people. The Bible says it plainly. All have sinned. All have sinned. But that's a hard reality, I think, for us to come to. Yeah, yeah, we've read that in scriptures. We know what the Bible says. But I tell you, oftentimes we are just like those convicts on that galley ship. And we have a lot of excuses. We have a lot of reasons why I'm in this situation that I find myself in. It's kind of like that ongoing joke, I'm sure many of you heard before, that it's all a bunch of innocent people that are in prison. One of the parts of my job is, is in the Navy is, is that whenever the captain, the, uh, the commanding officer of a command is giving what we call non-judicial punishment, that we call it NJP, the military is full of all these kind of anachronisms, but it's kind of like punishment within the, the Navy itself, all right? It doesn't really mean anything outside of the Navy, but it's punishment within the Navy. And one of the things that I do as a chaplain is I talk to the people that are going to be standing in front of the captain about the charges that they have and about what happened that they found themselves in that particular situation. And I tell you, oftentimes it is exactly like those prisoners on that galley ship. There's a lot of excuses. The alcohol made me do it. The prescription drugs that I'm on made me do it. My spouse made me do it. I might have used that one once or twice. <laughs> But very rarely do we find one where they'll stand there and say, you know what, chaps, I'm guilty, and I deserve to be punished. And I tell you, I've stood in a lot of these proceedings, and more often than not, the CEOs are more gracious to the people that will just come clean than the ones that have all of those excuses. But that's a hard thing to admit all have sinned. And whenever we use it collectively, maybe that's a little bit easier, but whenever I say Victor has sinned, and you put your name there, you have sinned. 
That's hard. But here's the thing. The scripture is full of making sure that it points that reality out because nothing makes sense in scripture until we understand that point because it is only a sinner that is in need of a savior. Let me say that again. It is only a sinner that is in need of a savior. And I've said this often, friends, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That is level ground. No one stands superior there. We are all in equal need of Christ Jesus and what it is that he has done for you and for me. Because it's only a sinner that's in need of a savior. And as we've considered this, and as you've been walking with Christ, some of you many years, and you understand these realities, the question that we have to look into a little bit further this morning, though, is what practices have you put into place to put those roadblocks, those road guards, if you will, those curbs, to keep you from continuing those patterns of sinfulness? And this is where the sermon probably takes a little bit of a turn to the uncomfortable. Let's read out of James chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. This will serve as our primary passage. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. If you have it, go ahead and turn open there. James says this, starting at verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Look there in verse 16 again. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray to each other so that you may be healed. Now, before we continue in this sermon, and before I continue to unpack this, uh, this passage here, let me make something very explicitly clear. The reality is, is that no human being can forgive another human being for sin. No human being can forgive another human being for sin. Why? Because every human being has sinned, right? That would be like the prisoner pardoning the fe their fellow prisoner. I'm sure that maybe a lot of that happens in prison, but it's not very effective, right? I don't think that it's legally binding, okay? So there is no human being on this earth that has the capacity to forgive you of your sin. The absolution of sin belongs to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Why? Because he atoned for it. Because he's the one that went to the cross. Not me, not you, not anyone else. Jesus Christ went to the cross. So therefore, Jesus Christ is the sole individual that has the ability to be able to abstain us and give us the absolution of sin. So, this passage is not a prescription for the practice of the religious elite to offer forgiveness of sin. That is not what James is saying here. However, though, notice this. In this passage, James says that the confession of sin is mutual. Look at that. To each other, to one another. Depending on what version you have, that's what it will say. That means that there's a mutual exchange that is going on here. Confessing sin to each other is a mutual exchange. Not the forgiveness of sin, but the confession of sin. And there is great benefit. There is great benefit in the mutual confession of sin. There are a multiplicity of reasons why, but primarily one of those would be that in isolation, sin demands a person to be by themselves. It withdraws them from the community. And the more isolated a person is, the more destructive the power of sin is over them. Confession to a brother or a sister in Christ destroys this deadly autonomy 
that so oftentimes exist. It pulls down the barriers of hypocrisy and it allows the free flow of grace to exist within the community. That is the reason why we do it. Now I understand this is uncomfortable. But friends, we have to understand that Christianity is not an exercise that is done as an individual exercise. It's not the way that it works. Christianity, by its very nature, is to be done in community. Community. And that means that sometimes in community, we have fun, we share together, we laugh together, we pray together. Sometimes, though, it means that we confess together. There's a necessity of it. Uncomfortable? Yes. But the community requires this in order for it to become more unified and united together in strength. That's why we do it. It's uncomfortable, though. It is uncomfortable. But you know, here's the thing about comfort in the scripture. I haven't found it in here yet. I've looked, trust me, I've looked, where God says, Victor, I want you to be comfortable. <laughs> I'm still looking. Been to a lot of school where we studied the Bible together. Still haven't found that yet. I found a lot of passages about obedience. I found a lot of passages that talk about carrying out the mission. I found a lot of passages that talk about sacrifice. Haven't found that passage regarding my personal comfort level and how I think that it should be quite high. <laughs> you know, we could equate this to the difference between a cruise ship and a battleship. On a cruise ship, what is it? Man, it's comfortable. It's decadent. It is all about you. It is customer service to the extreme. Depending upon what version of cruise ship you get on, some the bathrooms don't work and there's Ebola and whatnot, but we're not talking about that kind, <laughs> right? We're talking about the good ones, all right? We're talking about the ones where, you know what? You come and you get your food whenever you want to get your food. If you want to go into your bedroom, there's a turn down service and we're going to make the towels into some interesting animal and your wife will post about it on Facebook. <laughs> you know, some of you probably have been on, on, a, on a naval vessel. I assure you that is not the experience that you will have. The captain of a cruise ship is concerned about your comfort. Captain on a naval vessel could care less about your comfort. If you went to the captain of that ship and you said, sir, um, you know, I'm just not able to get out of bed. And so I'd like breakfast to be moved at least an hour to the right. He would look at you and he'd say, go get yourself checked out by chaps because there's something wrong with you. Because what is it on a warship? On a warship is about the mission. It's about getting the mission done. It is about going out and doing what America has called that ship to do. It's not about your comfort. It's about the community on that ship. And the community of that ship getting done what needs to be done. Period. Friends, sometimes I think that whenever we practice this faith, we get confused. And we think that we've walked on that cruise ship. And Christ has said, no, you're going to be on this battleship. You've got a mission to accomplish, and it's going to require some discomfort. It's going to require some personal growth. In our case this morning, it's going to require some confession. What we're talking about is we're talking about biblical accountability. 
Biblical accountability is the development of relationships with other believers which promote spiritual authenticity, honesty, and ultimately deepen our relationship with God. It's about relationships. And I'm not talking about the Facebook facade relationship, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about depth of relationship. And depth of relationship doesn't come whenever everything is perfect and everything looks great and everything is posed in just the right way. Authenticity comes with the real and the raw. It comes with the good and the bad. That is where depth of relationship is found. And that is what Christ is calling us to, to live authentically with each other. And that means that I say to you, you know what? My life is not perfect. My wife and I, sometimes we fight. My kids, they're not perfect either. Sometimes I mess up at work. Sometimes I lose my temper. Sometimes I look at things that I know I shouldn't look at. That's real. That's authentic. And that's what Christ has called us to do. Now on Sunday morning, that's probably an impossibility. A Sunday morning experience isn't designed for that. But that's the reason why this church and a multiplicity of other churches say life groups are something that you're supposed to be a part of. Because their authentic relationships can develop. This is the reason why more than one pastor has encouraged you probably along your path to embrace and to accept an accountability partner. Someone that you partner in life with that helps hold you accountable of those issues that you need to come clean with. It's about developing relationships of, authentic, of authenticity. That's what we are called to do. Friends, as Christians, we must reject those superficial relationships that are common within secular society and sadly, friends, within many congregations. That's one of the reasons why Erica and I came here to this church. Because as great as the Sunday morning's experience is, because as cool as Ken is and, and Devin and the rest of the staff there's authenticity that exists here in this place. And I assure you that there is a world that has enough superficiality about it that they don't need another place to go on Sunday morning that's going to offer them another superficial experience. They need real. They need authentic. Friends, we must try to deepen our relationships with each other's and we are called to strive to overcome that discomfort that often comes with being transparent and authentic with each other. Oftentimes, this is the greatest obstacle that prevents us from growing deeper with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And our success, our success is not measured by what you do or what I do, but what we do as the body of Christ. Richard Foster, in his book called Celebration of Discipline, it's a great book, you should get it if you haven't already read it, he says this about confession. Confession is a difficult discipline for us because we all too often view the becoming, the believing community as a fellowship of saints before we see it as a fellowship of sinners. We feel that everyone else has advanced so far into their holiness that we are isolated and alone in our sin. We cannot bear to reveal our failures and our shortcomings to others. We imagine that we are the only ones who have not stepped onto the high road of heaven. Therefore, we hide ourselves from one another and we live in veiled lies and hypocrisy. Veiled lies and hypocrisy. Just like I spoke about before, isolation. One of the things that Erica and I love to do is we love to watch documentaries on animals. 
And having lived in Tanzania for a little while, we got to see some of that stuff for ourselves. And many of you know this, that the, that the lion on the Serengeti, what do they look for whenever they're evaluating a herd? They look for that one that is just a little bit isolated, right? They survey and they watch and they wait for that one gazelle, that one zebra, whatever it happens to be, to just stray away from the herd a little bit. And then once after they see that that one has isolated itself, maybe even just a minute amount, what do they do? They pounce. The scripture makes it very clear that Satan is like a roaring lion. I think that that equivocation is given to us for a very clear reason because the author saw how lions hunt. And all it takes is just a little bit of us going in isolation, veiling ourselves in hypocrisy, refusing to develop authentic relationships that cause us discomfort. And I assure you, Satan, Satan will pounce upon that because he is the enemy of all who call upon Christ. This is the reason why we do this together as a collective exercise. So one of the things that we must do as we come to the grips of coming clean is we strive to overcome the fear of honesty and vulnerability. Friends, I'm not going to lie I'm not going to stand up here and try to tell you that this is easy stuff. It's not. It's not. It's hard. Anybody that would come to you and tell you, oh, yeah, this Christian thing is so easy. All you got to do is this, and you get a lot of stuff with it, health, wealth, prosperity. Well, I tell you what, they ain't reading the same book that I am. We have to... Look at those fears that oftentimes serve as those obstacles. We have to look at those fears and say, you know what? I am not going to stop myself from speaking because I'm afraid about what other people might think about me. I am not going to make this confession because I'm afraid that I won't look as good as she does or he does. Those are lies that Satan whispers to each and every one of us. Don't tell them that. If you make that confession, do you know what they'll think about you? If you speak that, do you know what they'll go home and say? Do you know what they might post on social media if you do that? Those are all the whispers that we hear that Satan likes to speak. But this is the reason why we are called to do it. Now, there are some parameters on this, on who we talk to and, and who we confess to, who we share with and who we're vulnerable to. Let me say this. The act of confessing your sin is reserved for an audience of a mature believer. Okay? Okay? So this is not what I recommend. I do not recommend the person that was just baptized. They get up, they're still dripping wet, they're, 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 they got the towel on, you say, hey, I got to talk to you, brother. Uh, you know, I've got this issue with my wife and blah, 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 blah. That's not the person to do this to, the mature believer in Christ. Now, let me say this. Maturity is not necessarily by seniority, Okay. So just because you have seniority in the congregation doesn't necessarily make you mature. I would hope that it does, but not necessarily. Friends, when you're seeking this person out, someone that you can mutually confess with, you're looking for someone that you know to be mature in the faith, someone that has demonstrated their faith, been living in the faith for a season of time, someone that you know that you can speak with, and that they're not going to share what it is that you have. Someone who is not going to be shocked 
whenever you give them whatever it is that you need to give them as you come clean. It's reserved for a mature believer. And that's up to you to find that mature believer. You have to do a little work. Sometimes the mature believer will come, will come to you and your paths will cross. Sometimes it requires a little digging on your part. But that's the reason why you have a pastor. That's the reason why you have a staff. Let me say this as well. Ken is a great guy. But he cannot be the accountability partner for all of you in this church. He can't. He just can't do it. He would try because that's his spirit, but he can't do it. So let me say this as a pastor trying to protect a fellow pastor. Don't all of you rush Ken as soon as he comes back from sabbatical saying, Victor gave me, he'll get really mad at me. All right? Do some work. Look in your life group. Do this amongst each other. This is how the community grows. This is how it gets stronger. This is how you uplift each other. This is how you step off of the cruise ship and you walk onto the battleship. When we participate in this act of confession, ultimately what you do, friends, is you shed light into the darkness. How does John begin the gospel of John? A light came into the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Referring to Christ. Satan dwells in darkness. This is where he finds strength and power. In the darkness of your mind, in the dark recesses, in the closets that you've shut off from everyone and everything, this is where Satan draws his power. But when you fling open those doors and you allow the light of Christ to shine in there, the darkness cannot withstand the light. And we are responsible to share with one another so that that light might shine into those dark places. So, we strive to overcome a fear, and we must strive to possess the humility of a teachable attitude. It means that we stand up and we say, you know what? I'm not perfect, and I got things to learn. Teachability is a, is a key aspect to growth. This can be found in the academic world. It can be found in a multiplicity of disciplines. But remaining teachable is a key. Having a humble heart and saying, you know what, I can learn from that person. I can learn from whomever God has brought into my path. You know, I've gotten to learn that lesson and see that. Whenever I was a, a young associate pastor working at a small little country church in Potosi, Missouri. You've never heard of it before. It's pronounced Potosi, not Potosi, all right? Potosi, Missouri. Erica and I, we were Bible college students driving 70 miles so that we could get to our little weekend ministry. And I'll never forget, there's a young man, actually he wasn't that young, he was the same age as me, named Ronnie Paggi. Now, Ronnie grew up poor. And whenever I say poor, I mean poor. He lived in a little trailer down the road, didn't even have feet, heat in it, and for those of you who don't know, in other parts of the country, it gets cold. <laughs> and Ronnie started to come to church, reluctantly at first, but he started to come to church. And Ronnie and I kind of built up a little bit of a relationship with each other, but he was standoffish at first. And I said, well, Ronnie, why don't you, 
why don't you come to our little Sunday school that we've got? And Ronnie said, well, Victor, I'm afraid to go to your Sunday school. And I said, afraid? Why? And he said to me, well, because I can't read, Victor. And one time, whenever I was a little, little younger, the teacher in my Sunday school class asked me to read a passage in the Bible. We were reading together, and I couldn't do it, and I felt stupid and ashamed. And I said to him, Ronnie, how about this? How about if I never ask you to read in Sunday school, you'll come? He said, okay, you got a deal, I'll come. Ronnie didn't have transportation to church, but I tell you what, he was there every time those doors were open. He'd walk, he'd walk, he'd walk. And he'd be there. He'd be there before I was there. And Ronnie and I started to build up this relationship with each other. And Ronnie, he, he just had a different perspective in life than I did. I remember one Sunday night, I was running late. I needed to, to get someplace, and I was going to give Ronnie a, a ride home because things had kind of gone over at church, and I didn't want to walk home, especially on the side of the highway in the dark. I said, come on, Ronnie, let's go, man. We're late. And I'm rushing out to the car and grabbing my Bibles and my books and this and that, papers. And Ronnie just stops in the middle of this gravel parking lot out in the middle of the country. And he's staring up in the sky. I said, Ronnie, what are you doing, man? Let's get in the car. We got to go. And he said, just look at that, Victor. I said, just look at what? He said, just look at that. So I looked up in the sky, and I said, yeah, Ryan, it's just stars and the moon. And he said, look at that. Our God made that. He put each one of those stars in their place. And I tell you what, Ronnie made me feel pretty stupid at that moment. Because Ronnie was appreciating the creation that's around us in a way that me and my busy schedule had failed to look at. There I was, a Bible college student, head of his class, so smart, but I had a lot to learn. And Ronnie Paggi, a poor kid from Potosi, Missouri, who's illiterate, taught me a lesson I will never forget. We all have something to learn from someone, friends. I don't care what package it comes in. I don't care what it looks like. We all have something to learn from everyone. It requires a humble attitude to remember that, though. Coming to confession, though, means a lot of things. But let's talk about what it's not. In the practice of confession, it's important to know what it doesn't look like. It is not an excuse for having committed a wrong. That is not what confession is. It's not an excuse. It's not for you sitting there saying, well, I would have, could have, should have. No, it's coming clean. That's what confession is about. It's not an attempt to simply move on. All right, I'm going to say I'm sorry just so we can move on from this, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not just move on. It's to stop. Reflect, consider, think. Why? So that we cannot repeat the same behavior. Figuring out what my triggers are. Why am I drawn to that? When is this temptation the greatest for me? It's pausing and considering and meditating. It's asking an accountability partner and most importantly, asking Christ to search your heart. That's what coming clean looks like. And it's certainly not an endeavor to just make things like they were. We often use this phrase, forgive and forget. Forgive, yeah, that's right, but don't forget. Remember. Remember. Remember the pain sometimes that you have felt. Remember the pain that you have inflicted to someone else. Remember those things so the next time you're tempted to act in that manner or 
participating in whatever it is, you remember not just an endeavor to move forward and move past something. These are the way that we're supposed to confess. Confession to Christ who forgives our sin and confess to one another who help hold us accountable. That's what genuine confession looks like, friends. It's the recognition of our powerlessness to make things better, because we can't. And it calls us to look at the power of God for what we cannot do for ourselves. But it requires that we step out. Step out of what is comfortable, what is known, and to what is uncomfortable and makes us vulnerable. Max Lucado, in his little book called The Woodcutter's Wisdom, tells a story about a group of people. They lived in a cold, damp, wet cave. But one day, to these cave dwellers, this, this man, a stranger, he came and he did something that they had never seen done before. He took this pile of sticks, put it all together, took a device that sparked, and he created what they saw for the first time was fire. He created fire for those afflicted, cold cave dwellers. Now, the reaction of the cave dwellers was, was a little curious. It was fear. Rather than come to the fire and warm themselves, what did they do? They ran further back and deeper into the cave. And there they shivered in the darkness. But there was one of them, just one, a little more curious than the rest. And he ventured forward. And he, he embraced the kindness of the stranger. He came to realize that the light was not, was not something wicked or evil or dangerous, but rather the light of the fire was good. It was warm. It was life-giving. He walked a little bit out into the shadow, and he he spoke there into the darkness and he said to those cave dwellers, his brothers and sisters, his family members, come out. Come out from that dampness. Come out from the cold. Come, come out. Come and, and know this stranger who has lit this fire for us. This fire is warm. It's good. It, I'm not shivering for the first time in my entire life. But from the darkness, he heard his fellow cave dwellers say, shut up, be quiet, go back to where you came from. We're not coming out of this place. We're going to stay here in the darkness in the damp, we're going to continue to shiver and be cold. Confused, the, the one cave dweller that had come to embrace the kindness of the stranger looked at him and said, why? Why won't they come out? And the stranger replied this, they choose the chill, for though it's cold, it's what they know. They'd rather be cold than a change. Friends, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And Satan dwells in the darkness. It is there in the darkness that Satan whispers, 
you're not good enough. Don't share that. Remain veiled. Remain hypocritical if you must. But don't confess. Stay away from the lie. But Satan has no power over Christ. For Christ has called each and every one of us. He has come into the world and he has offered us a light. And he says, you have a place on my crew. And we have a mission to accomplish. Sometimes you will be uncomfortable. Sometimes it will require your obedience. Sometimes it will require your sacrifice. But come. Come and be on my crew. Because we got things to do. We got places to go. We got people to save. We've got a mission to accomplish. Cast off your fears. Sink your trepidation. And allow yourself to come clean and confess. Friends, we're going to enter into our time of communion with one another. One of the things that we are commanded to do by Scripture is to search our heart before we partake of this communion, where we remember the body and the blood of Christ that was broken and shed for us. We confess to him, for he is the only one that can forgive us. He is the only one that has paid the pardon of your sin. So as we go into this time of communion with each other, I invite you to search your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what you need to confess. But remember that confession, confession takes root. Not only whenever we confess to Christ, but when we confess one to another. So maybe now is a time for you to begin that prayer. Lord, who is it that you're showing me? Who is it that I can be transparent with? Who is it that I can be vulnerable with? Which brother or sister here on this earth is mature that I can share with? So that I can continue to serve on your crew. Let us search our hearts and our minds together. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we come before you now. And we are thankful for this time that you have given to us. We are thankful for this time that we can share with each other and we can look into your scripture and we can know what it is that you have done for us and what it is that you are giving to us. Lord, I pray and I ask that you would continue to give us the strength that we require the courage and the conviction to come clean, to come out of the darkness and embrace the warm, beautiful light of your forgiveness. Lord, let us be, let us be faithful and true to what it is that you have given to us. For this we do pray in your righteous and holy name, O Lord Jesus. Amen.